Okay, welcome to lecture nine. The title of the lecture is Ordinary Differential Equations, Finite Difference Methods. I'm going to first begin with finite difference derivatives in general, um, and then talk about ordinary differential equations. Now, before I begin, uh, I, I want to say that uh, I thought this coronavirus was all very distant from me, but then I learned a couple weeks ago that a friend of mine lost her father in China, not directly through coronavirus, but because he was in ill health and in the reallocation of health resources, um, he died. So uh, my sympathies go out to anybody else in the here who um, has similar family uh, experiences. Uh, now on the positive side, I also just yesterday got uh, email uh, pictures emailed to me from a friend who recently just got married in India. So uh, to some extent, life goes on. Now, I'm speaking to you from my house. Uh, the reason is I got into my office today and then was informed that uh, there be frequent tests of the fire alarm system. And so, well, I figured the audio quality was much more reliable here. Uh, so now the other thing I want to point out is that, uh, yes, we had a delay in today's lecture. Now the next three lectures are given by my Zurich buddies and colleagues. Uh, now there will probably be delays with those uh, lectures also because, uh, you know, w with this crisis, some of our ex some of our burdens are released. You know, things we can't do, but then for some people, they have extra burdens. Uh, so basically, my colleagues uh, will be producing um, the lectures, uh, perhaps in pre-recorded form, uh, but they are going to come to you. Now, I fully expect that we'll be back up to full um, schedule on time by my next lecture, which is scheduled for January 31. And of course, in the meantime, you have homework to do. So we timed everything perfectly, I guess. Now, let me, uh, now I do encourage you to make a uh, comments in the chat room, uh, but, uh, okay, let me just, oh, yeah, okay, the everyone. Okay, anyway, so um, if you have comments, uh, please um, send them to me or by via chat. You can try raising your hand, uh, but I think the chat room is more reliable. And, okay, so let's begin. Differentiation. Now, derivatives, as we've seen, are very important for, uh, for doing numerical methods, particularly for optimization, because you need to compute derivatives in order to compute gradients. You need them also to compute second-order derivatives uh, in, to, to construct a Hessian. Now, the computer by the way, um, most computers, most software does not know calculus. They, they just, uh, they didn't take those courses. So the way that they will do derivatives um, is by what we call finite difference methods. So I'm first going to talk about finite difference methods uh, that are used, um, that can be used and show them how they work on a particular example I have here. And so uh, this is the function I'm using. I don't know where I got it from. Uh, probably some problem, some book or something. And that's that, but that's the function I'm gonna use to show how um, you compute finite difference derivatives. Now, Here's the, the finite difference. The formula that we're most used to 
uh, for derivatives is the one-sided formula for our first derivative. That says that if you want to approximate f prime of x, then what you do is you compute f, um, for, by the way, f test is the name of this function here. So f test. Now, if we want to compute one-sided derivative for that function, we would compute x at x plus epsilon for some small, for small epsilon, and subtract off f of x, and then divide by epsilon. So this is rise over run. Now, this is a finite difference formula. And of course, as epsilon goes to 0, you will converge, if the function is differentiable, to the true derivative. And in fact, that's how the derivative is defined. The problem is you can't stick zero in here and get the, and have the computer give you anything. So I'm going to show you some some uh, examples of how the quality of the derivative depends on epsilon. This is a block of code that generates the tables we're going to see. So now. Uh, Truth, yeah, well, I've computed truth already, and I'm going to do everything around x0 equals 1. So then what we see here is that uh, here are the various epsilons, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3, 4, etc., 10 to the minus 15. Now, if I use infinite precision arithmetic to do the finite difference, then we see that at epsilon being 10 to the minus 2, uh, the result isn't good. But of course, it, it's not going to be good for epsilons that are too big. But we see that at epsilon 10 to the minus 5, we basically get the, the truth answer, which is 1657, negative 1567. Now, there is some error that's not expressed here. And here we see the error. So basically, if you have infinite precision arithmetic, then you can take epsilon down to, well, basically machine epsilon, and still get and get an excellent finite difference solution for the derivative. However, we don't have infinite precision arithmetic. Generally, you're stuck with finite precision, double double um, precision, and now we see that uh, well. Uh, 10 to the minus 2 doesn't work again. Of course it doesn't. Um, but then now the error does come down. And now in this sweet range, sweet spot between 10 to the minus 5 and 10 to the minus 8, we see that the error using finite precision arithmetic is quite small. But then as we use smaller and smaller epsilons, the error grows. And when you use epsilon 10 to the minus 14, or even even 10 to the minus 13, the, the, ans the answer is uh, nonsense. Very big errors. Now, why is that? Well, that's because um, when you have epsilon being very small in the finite difference formula, you have the e epsilon is very small. And so x plus epsilon is almost equal to x, which means these two evaluations of f are almost equal to each other. So you're subtracting two numbers that are close to being equal to each other. And that's exactly when you're going to get big round off error. And so basically, here is the, uh, uh, the facts. So for the, when you're using finite precision. So what we see here is that things are good 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 8. Now, it is, um, this is important for setting convergence criteria in um, algorithms and variety of uh, other times when you have to decide when to stop. And, and, here, and here is a very precise case of when you, what, what should the h be the time step or the epsilon, uh, I guess, um, uh, for, to get the best possible derivatives, given that you find a precision arithmetic, and here uh, you should be between 10 to the minus 6 and 10 to the minus 
10. Um, now, now the other thing though is that it's natural to use three points to compute a uh, first derivative. Now there what we do is we end up with formulas. Okay, this, what I'm going through here is the derivation. So um, what I'm trying to do here is find what is the best formula that takes, that uses f at x naught, the point at which you're trying to compute the derivative, but then also using um, f value at x2 and x1, where x1 is something to the left and x2 is something to the right. And the way you derive this is you, you your, your finite derivative formula is going to be a times, well, is going to end up being a times f at some value and b at some other value. And so you're going to need to find the, the right a, b, c. And what we find here, this is the right formula. And now it turns out that the coefficients are this. And then all that calculus does is then tell you that the best three-point symmetric, I've assumed symmetric here, that x1 is h units to the left and x2 is h units to the right. And so basically you put weight, um, you, this is f of x naught plus h, that's the forward um, evaluation, here's the backwards. And so um, basically you put no weight on f of x naught and you take this difference, divide by two h, the reason you divide by two h is because these two points are two h apart. And then the symmetric rule, uh, so you get this is a symmetric rule for a three point formula for a first derivative. And now then we see here's what happens in, in the case for our special function. Now we go down uh, this chart again, we find out that if we have an infinite precision arithmetic, uh, 10 to the minus six and, and less gives you absolutely excellent, almost perfect uh, results. But again, for finite precision arithmetic, you have small errors. The errors are small only when the, um, the step h is between, uh, is roughly 10 to the minus five to 10 to the minus seven. Uh, now, now here we, here's the standard calculation for what is the error. See the error, and this comes from a uh, Taylor series um, expansion here. The error is, um, is for an arbitrary h, the error is, first of all, epsilon over h is the error that's just because of finite um, precision in, in epsilon, the error relative to h at step, step size. This is the dominant remainder in the Taylor series formula. And then to find that what we're gonna do is minimize, uh, we wanna find what h gives you the smallest error and what we see is that that h should be on the order of epsilon to the one third, where epsilon is, um, think of this as being the smallest possible um, error, which is 10 to minus 16. So this says right here, for two-sided formula, you should have um, the, step, the step size should be roughly 10 to the minus uh, six, 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus six. So this Taylor series expansion um, tells you, and this approach tells you what your step size should be. Now I'm going to show you some graphics. Here is one of those <coughs> uh, uh, CDF files, which I posted. And so here we have a there's a, we have a choice of three functions. E to the x is the one we're going to look at. And we're going to evaluate the derivative at zero. So that's this at zero. And here's the true derivative, <coughs> the red line. <coughs> now, 
what's a picture if we do have a forward derivative? So if we have a forward difference, that means we, and the step size h is one, that means we take, evaluate f at zero and f at one, and then look at that secant line and take that slope. And we see that the absolute, the error is 7183, um, because the true slope is one, and um, so the error is 7183. Now we could also look at it, you could also do backwards errors, and of course the answer is symmetrically, yeah, it's, it's not the same, but it also is not good. Um, now here, the, now what we could do is show the central error, and now here's, the, here's what the central, the two point central difference looks like. You have f of one minus f at minus one, and now the secant uh, slope line has slope 1.175, and so the error is um, 0.1752. So this is the, the exact value is one. So we see how the central um, finite difference formula looks graphically versus the forward and backwards and uh, now also what I could do is I could cut h in half and now what you see is that the errors see, so now I've centered it basically at 0.5 and now evaluated the h is at about 0.5 so we're at we're still evaluating at f at, uh, f at zero and now we see that with a smaller step size, uh, the errors have dropped. And now if we go to an even smaller step size, it's dropped again. So we see that uh, these errors do um, decline as we take a smaller and smaller step size. Now, what this, uh, what this notebook does now is it goes through and shows you the three-point formula for a second derivative uh, and four point formula for first derivative, five point for first, five point for second. I'm not going to um, uh, go through all of them. And the last example here is where we have a nine point formula for the second derivative. And what I'll show you is that the optimal step size is on the order of epsilon to the one ninth. And since epsilon is about 10 to the minus 16, this is about 10 to the minus two. So if you're doing nine points for the second derivative, then the optimal um, uh, finite difference is um, about 0.01, uh, much bigger. And so that's, the more points you use, the, the bigger the step sizes can be. Now, Okay, so that's what the computer does for um, finite, finite differences. Now, some of you, um, by the way, the word automatic here should be efficient. Um, the title of the slide is efficient derivatives, and that's, I'm gonna edit it, so that's what that is also. Now, given the importance of derivatives, many of you are tempted to uh, by hand compute derivatives and the, the symbolic derivatives. Now, um, by the way, my attitude is I'm never going to compute derivatives by hand um, because I'm almost surely going to mess up badly. Um, but I'm, if you insist on doing derivatives by hand, what you really should do is have the appropriate software to help you. And so I'm gonna show you how you could proceed. And I think this is intuitively the way you do proceed when you wanna simplify something, some symbolic derivatives. So let's say we have a CES utility function. Now I say CES utility function because Notice here uh, that I'm summing, there, there's a number of variables, x, y, z, w, 
and I'm taking the sigma power of each one, adding them up with weights a, i, and then taking the power of phi. Now, if this is a CES um, and production fun constant returns to get a production function, this would be one over sigma. Uh, but I want to think in terms of utility function where basically uh, the sigma is here and then phi is bigger than one over sigma so that the result is a concave or less than one over sigma, any one way of this. So the result is a concave utility function. Now let's look at the operation count. Uh, you have to do five powers. See, there's one power for each of the variables plus then after summing you have another power. Remember, exponentiation, taking powers is expensive. And then we have to do three additions and four multiplications multiplications being for each of these a times a variable. 12 flops. Now let's compute the gradient. Uh, look at the mess now. Each gradient uses six powers, five additions, eight multiplications, 95 flops for the total. So each, each one is 19 and you have four of these, that's 95 flops. So basically, if you did this, when you compute the four terms of the gradient vector, the time cost of computing that is eight times the cost of producing the one function evaluation. Now, but now you see that you say, oh, I can simplify that. I can simplify that. And so one thing you can do is you notice that uh, this expression, the, the sums of these powers, um, are common. Furthermore, this sum was com computed when you did the utility function evaluation. So basically, this is something you have to compute when you compute evaluate the utility function. So instead, when you do that computation, you store that into some register saying B1. And then now we substitute out the repeated appearance of this into our new grad formula. And now we see that this is uh, much better because now this is just gonna be a scalar raised to a power uh, as opposed to all those other things that were then raised to this power. So now that looks better. Now we can do even, we can, we can continue to do better because uh, uh, we can, we can replace that. Remember, some terms had power uh, theta minus one, others had, or sigma minus one, and then also there were some terms that were sigma times theta. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace sigma minus one with this symbol, which is sounds like which is no phi 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 minus one is phi m one, which is phi minus one. And here's sigma minus one, and here's sigma theta. So I generate new names, which are mnemonics for what now I do those substitutions. And you see that sigma phi now pops up in four places. So in, now I, if I pre compute sigma phi, then I just plug them in here. Uh, same now, um, the same thing with the phi m1 and the sigma m1. Now, by the way, you notice that some of these powers uh, occur repeatedly. So I'm going to basically say now sigma phi times V1 to phi M1. We're going to replace that with a V2. And now with that, we are now down. We have now gotten the expression down to this much simpler thing. Now, by the way, we had to do some arithmetic to get these values, I think that adds up to be like about five flops. But now here, each one of these um, is, uh, okay, my count might have been, oh, um, yeah, you have to do these four powers and then you have three multiplications. Um, so this number should be bigger, sorry, but uh, it's a much lower count. Um, and frankly, if I do keep going, I can get the cost of this down um, further. 
Now consider the Hessian. Here's the Hessian elements. Boy, that looks messy. Um, now I just do the three substitutions that I had derived before, and now we've gotten something less. And now we've got these V1 to the five minus two powers. So substitute that out by computing V1. This we also got V1 to the. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. Um, uh, anyway, so that didn't. Oh, that didn't do anything. Sorry, this should have been a phi. I got to make that here now. The phi. The phi minus two terms, I'm going to substitute out here. And now we get V1 to the phi M2. And then the same thing with the, there was two sigma minus two, I get rid of those. Um, and then there's uh, some of these terms that are being like here, sigma M1 and sigma phi, replace those. Now get these powers that are computer repeatedly to be stored. Um, and now we're down to um, this final expression. So there are 16 ele elements here. And uh, then we have a lot fewer um, fl floating point operations to perform. So this is what you, and, the, and I could go even further, but that's a good place to stop. So this is what you're doing, I suspect, when you're uh, trying to do this by hand, uh, this is basically what, what you're doing. Now, you could get Mathematica to do this, um, but I still recommend, no, don't do this by hand or even with Mathematica. Now, next week, Philip is gonna be talking about something that really is what we call automatic differentiation um, because nowadays, many, many of the software programs that are out there uh, went to calculus class and got excellent grades in their calculus class. So now, if you're running that software, um, and Philip will introduce you to uh, one particular case, Casati, if you're running that software, you never have to do anything by hand in terms of derivatives. The computer will do the derivatives for you, but also do these substitutions that I just talked about, do it automatically or do everything in a manner so that you will get very efficient expressions for your derivatives. Now, by the way, I should point out that this was recognized even in the mid 60s by at least one economist. Bob Hall, uh, at the mid 60s, developed a software package which became known as TSP. And what he did in the software package was to implement basic rules of calculus along with the substitutions uh, to create efficient derivatives for TSP. So this has been around in one form or another for a while. It really didn't get absorbed into the computational science software until the mid 80s. Uh, now, however, it's a standard uh, feature of the of what's called modeling languages like GAMS, Ample, and AIM. Uh, yeah, there's been a lag in bringing that capability to think to programs like MATLAB. But now Philip will tell you how you can do that if you're using either MATLAB or Python. And that's, that's a much more recent development. So basically there's no excuse really now. And by the way, using Excel doesn't count as an excuse. Uh, there's no excuse now for economists to spend any time themselves managing the uh, comp computing code for derivatives. Also, what this means is that uh, those derivatives now that are used are going to be much more accurate than the ones that come from finite differencing. Now, next, finite difference methods, and in particular for differential equations. 
Uh, by the way, does anybody have any questions at this point? Uh, speak up if you do. Uh, it's a natural time for me to um, uh, take a soda water break. Okay. Now let's uh, proceed with talking about ordinary difference equations. Now, I'd say in economics, ordinary difference equations has come into favor and then out of favor. I remember as a graduate student four years ago, uh, having macro courses, um, growth theory courses, where we used um, continuous time models. But then uh, in the 80s and 90s, uh, things tend to migrate to um, discrete time. Now, one reason was that macro also migrated to um, being uh, focused on stochastic models and, and finite time, discrete time models are much easier to uh, use than continuous time models with uncertainty. Now, certain branches of finance um, are, are, are act, uh, use um, uh, Ito's lemma and the various uh, continuous stochastic um, optimization tools that are available, but mainstream macro um, stays with discrete time. That may be changing now. I see more papers using continuous time. So, uh, but sometimes um, differential equations is still the dominant way of modeling. Now, in particular, um, the literature on integrating climate and economic models is typically a continuous time process because uh, physics for the climate is, of course, a differential equation, partial differential equations. Um, but then when you do some approximation, you the climate can be approximated by a finite set of ordinary differential equations. So then you're going to match it up with an economic model. It's natural to think of the economic model also as being um, continuous time. So that literature um, does typically use continuous time uh, methods if it's doing problems with no uncertainty, then that leads you into the world of ordinary differential equations. Now, what is an ordinary difference equation? Well, suppose you have a function that takes uh, n possible values for y and one possible value for x and then gives you a, a, a gradient. Now, normally x here is time. So basically, this would be dy, dy dt. So how the y vector changes as time increases is some function of y and, and time. So this, but this is the formal definition of a system of ordinary difference equations. Sometimes we have just n1, and then sometimes it's a system. Now, by the way, there, this is in all dynamic problems, discrete time or continuous time, you need to have boundary conditions. Now, the simplest case is when you impose some initial values for y, that at this initial point x naught, you pin down all the values of y. This particularly is the case uh, for any model of the climate since the climate is based on Newtonian physics. And so if you know the state of the system today, then you know how it evolves um, in the next second. And then it's mapped out in a very deterministic fashion for the entire future. Now, when it comes to optimization problems, let's say a life cycle optimization problems, uh, you have, a, it's more difficult. It's what we call a two point boundary value problem because you may know the initial assets of somebody in a life cycle problem. And then you also may know the terminal assets, basically zero. 
but you don't know the initial consumption or you don't know the initial shadow price and you don't know the terminal consumption or, or shadow price. So that's a two point boundary value problem. Uh, many years ago, I once um, was asked to give a lecture uh, at Argonne Labs. This was what they call a town meeting of basically the three major uh, DOE labs uh, got together and there's a big conference and I was the plenary speaker talking about how um, exa scale computing um, could be useful in economics. And the point I made is that all that they're doing, any physics engineering, is an initial value problem, but that people were not particles. Uh, people behavior, the behavior of people today depends on what they think is going to happen in the future. And so that means that we now have a two point boundary value problem when you try to integrate economics with the climate. And so that means that you've got something orders of magnitude more complex. This requires you then to write down a much simplified climate model um, because just because when a piece, because if the climate piece is a two point boundary value problem, then the whole thing is a two point boundary value problem. Even if you have a million simple uh, ordinary difference equations with initial conditions known, if you have, but now we have a system that involving, involves economists, evolving people, their behavior appears. You don't have initial conditions for everything describing the people part. So the whole system is a two point boundary value problem. Uh, so anyway, so that's um, uh, the thing to remember. You, ha you have to have boundary values. No matter what your differential equation is, you have to have um, a num the, basically the number of conditions so here I basically if, you, if this is an n-dimensional differential equation you've got to pin down y the unknown at n points it could be it could be first and last but it could be any collection you have this by itself an n-dimensional ordinary differential equation has n degrees of freedom and an n-dimensional solution manifold you've got to pin things down in order to get the solution that you want. Um, now, by the way, all the ordinary, all differential equations are really first order differential equations. If you had a second order derivative, you just replace it by, you use this. And so you create um, a new variable, z, which is dy dx, and then dz dx is just, you know, this. So basically this is a, in, in macro, you're familiar with this, basically it's called, you know, even if you have a finite number of lags, what you do is you stack things so it's, um, everything is in a form where there's just one period lag. Uh, now, suppose we're trying to solve an initial value problem uh, in economics. And let's say here's the initial value problem, y prime equals f of x comma y. What do you do? Now, x, x is the independent variable, y is the dependent variable. So what you do is you set up a set of grid points, and this is a uniformly um, grid, uniformly spread out grid. By the way, I'm assuming that this is an initial value problem because I'm saying, well, the initial x naught is pinned down. Now then what we want to do is we want to find on this grid of Xi's a grid of Yi's, which are each, um, which represents what Y will be at X sub I. So that's the uh, a goal here. We've discretized the independent variable and now we've turned this into basically a difference equation is what we want to do. Now, one kind of schemes is where you basically say, okay, I, let's say I'm, I've solved the problem up to point xi. 
And so then I have yi, yi minus one, and I have all the, the x, I have xi and all the previous x's. And then now I'm at time at point x i plus one. I know its value. And then y at that value is going to be just an explicit function of everything up to that point in the space. Um, so this is what's called an explicit scheme because what you do is you just uh, you start out with y0 and then given y0 you can just compute y1 is equal to f of uh, x1 and x0 and you just keep going. Now another approach is an implicit scheme where the value at xi plus one is written in a fashion which involves the value at x i plus one. So uh, we'll see an example of that. Uh, and so we, this is, they're both difference equations with some initial condition. Now, here is the simplest uh, method for ordinary difference equations called the Euler method. So what we do is we're at, at x0, we know the true value, so that gives us a capital Y0 is fixed. And then now what we do is we just say, well, the next Y is gonna be equal to the past Y plus H times the, move, the gradient of the differential equation at the previous point Xi. So suppose you're here at Xi, and now suppose that the, um, the differential equation says that uh, the gradient or the movement of dy dx is a vector in, in this direction. So this is the vector representing uh, dy dx at this point. And so you say, well, you act as if dy dx is not gonna change between xi and xi plus one. And so you just go a straight line and here is Q is uh, the point at which you stop F when you get to XI plus one. And then here is the YI plus one under the Euler solution. And you just keep doing that on and on and on until uh, you get to your terminal time. There's a convergence theorem, wow, big deal. There's a, you know, basically the error is on the order of the square of the step size. Now, the problem with the Euler method, and we see this here, is that the, if this is the true path, this is the, this is the true path, uh, what happens here is that the Euler method, in this case, will overshoot it. But here's a case of when you get to that point, you will, um, I haven't drawn this in, but let's say that uh, the, ve the vector field has a lesser slope, that once you get here, you realize that the, um, the motion vector at that point is this, is this slower rising vector r. So what you say is, well, I probably over I probably overshot it. So now suppose that this see this is the gradient vector at x i plus one and at that point q. Now suppose that gradient vector was true over this entire interval. Well then what I do is I create p s which has the same slope as q r, but now I plant it here at point P and I move to here this point S. So the, the point here is that if you use the gradient flow at P, you get to Q. If you use the gradient flow at Q, but stick it back here at P, you would end up at S. And what you do is you have these two uh, possibilities. And so what you do is you average. And so that T then is where the Runge-Kutta method would take you. So, uh, and now the, the error also is on the order of H squared. However, it turns out to be in practice, uh, 
uh, faster and better. Now here you could do this, I'm not gonna draw a picture, but you could do okay, basically what the um, fourth order runga kata does is it does first order runga kata up to X, to up to the midpoint here. And then from there, it does another runga kata. Um, and so you end up with this formula. Um, so now this has asymptotic error of h to the fifth. So what happens is that if you double uh, the h, you reduce the error by 1 16th. However, RK4 only evaluates f four times per step. And so you uh, have uh, gotten by going, basically by going from RK2 to regular, to RK to RK4 over a particular H, you've gone from quadratic to H to the fifth um, convergence. Uh, so you, you've gotten a much lower error over the same region, uh, but you ha didn't have to compute, F only had to be computed four times. So again, you want to take uh, small step sizes, uh, or so, sorry, you want to use higher order methods like fourth order Runge-Kutta because uh, for a small amount of calculation, you will now get a much smaller error over your step size. Now, um, the, we have the systems of differential equations. Now suppose you have a system of ordinary differential equations. Y1 prime, let's say you have a vector Y1, Y2, et cetera. Y1 prime is equal to some function of X and the Y's y n prime is equal to some function of the x and the y's. Now, the way to do this is to then just apply Euler method to each of these differential equations. So what happens here is that you, suppose you have y i, the, the, let's say you have the big Y solution at X I, Euler equation, and then you use step size H, Euler equation would say that you would then write down this Euler equation, a uh, step for each uh, point X I plus one, and then get the new Y solution at that point I, X I plus one. So, now what happens here, this is very much like a Gauss-Jacobi kind of operation, because what you do is that each one of these differential equations is updated using the previous iterations results. And so by the way, you, if, you, if it was worth the effort, you could parallelize each one of these. Um, but that's, so what you do is you take one step at a time um, in all, all of these. So they, basically you have these Y's marching in uniform um, together um, and to sweep out um, the solutions for the Y vector. Now you could also do this for um, RK1, which just is that. And then there's RK4. So basically you just take the one dimensional um, definitions of Euler, RK1, and RK4, and then just apply them component-wise to the vectors uh, on, on a vector system. Um, now here, I'm gonna give you an example, uh, which um, I don't know, maybe you haven't seen, but uh, many of you have s seen the idea of signaling <coughs> that uh, the, the the Spence signaling model is one where uh, the interpretation would give it as the following. Um, uh, business schools provide no value added to somebody, but 
the way you sort out um, quality is by um, rewarding people for getting going to get an MBA or going to get more education because you know that the the more productive workers are those that have a lower cost of education. Um, so when you hire people, you look at how much education they had. Not that you expect that education to be of any direct usefulness, but it's that education is a signal to the employer that a person is high quality. And of course, everybody knows that that's a game. So everybody knows that going to college and getting an advanced degree or whatever is all bogus in terms of future performance capabilities. But you know that the farther you go on, go in this game the, and succeed, then the stronger signal you present to the, um, your future employers to prove that you're good. Um, I always found it ironic that Michael Spence, um, this is from his PhD, his PhD thesis, which <clears throat> was the foundation for his Nobel Prize. I always found it ironic that he then went on to be a business school dean. Um, and also here's a case of the, um, the errors. Uh, this, is a, this is a problem where it, we, we can use very, very tiny step sizes to get the solution. And here what we see is that uh, you take um, a time step of 0 0.1 or ex, um, education steps here. Um, right, so this is the this is the Euler with H equals 0 0.01. And then we see, oh, this is the error at various values for Y. Um, and so we see that as we use a small and smaller step size, the errors go down. But then you see when we use Runge Kutta, um, 0.01, the step size, the errors are order of magnitude less. And with 001 step size, but using first order Runge Kutta, we also have smaller errors than we did here back with the Euler equation. And then we go to RK4. Uh, we have uh, errors on the order 10 to the minus 3 and 10 to the minus 4. Now that took 0.27 units of time to compute. And then the comparable column in terms of quality um, is, is Euler 0 0.001, which took more time, uh, one point. One five. So the Euler equation, in order to get the same accuracy as RK4, the Euler method had to use a step size uh, 100 times smaller uh, yeah, than RK4. And so therefore, it was much more costly time-wise. So that yeah, shows you an example showing the trade-off. Now, the other kind of problem that comes up naturally here is a two-point boundary value problem. Um, and so say here you have uh, y and x now are both uh, scalars. And then um, as in physics, x dot means derivative with spec of x with respect to time. So that's in physics sort of the convention is a variable dot means the derivative with respect to time. And two dots means two derivatives. So now suppose we have this dynamic equation. And suppose that we know the initial value of one of the variables and we know the terminal value of another. And by the way, the example that we're going to see is one where you know the initial assets of somebody during his life, planning a life cycle, a consumption path, and then you know the terminal assets, which is basically zero. Now, how do you do this? How do you, because now this is a fully um, uh, interactive system um, because in order to 
in order to figure out what y0 is, you have to solve things out and be consistent with yt. So this is a fully connect, interconnected system of variables. Now, the shooting method says, okay, let's make a guess for y0. And now, when, if you know what x0 is and you make a guess for y0, then this is an initial value problem. And then you just shoot it forward in time and see where you are at time capital T. So y at this y of capital T, y naught, is the value of yt if your initial y is y0. So now notice that your value at time t for y is going to depend on the guess you made at time zero for y. So basically what we want to do is find out the y zero such that y capital T comma y zero does equal the terminal value. Uh, so basically this is now a nonlinear equation where y zero is the, um, the solution of this nonlinear equation. Now, of course, the thing is we can't send this directly off to a nonlinear equation solver because uh, we don't have this in closed form typically. So we have to write a procedure which computes um, the error for a given um, initial guess of y and then uh, try to find a zero for that as we vary y. Here's a life cycle consumption model, a labor supply and uh, Consumption, um, by the way, labor supply here is fixed. So basically at every point in time, you have a fixed labor income, you have, uh, you spend some money on consumption, and then um, now you have some assets, and each period of time, F of A is the return on those invested assets. So if you just stuck this into a uh, savings account that had an interest rate of little r, then F of A would just be little r times A. I want to just make this um, a more general one, so I put this in, um, in this form, F of A. Um, the Hamiltonian is this. Uh, the co-state equation is lambda dot equals rho lambda minus lambda F prime. Uh, we also have a first order condition. We know that the optimal choice of consumption uh, margin of consumption has to equal lambda. This then can be reversed so that you know what C is as a function of lambda. So then we have, here's the A dot equation, which is the same as the A dot equation up here. Uh, but now we replace C of T with capital C of lambda implicitly at time T. And then we have this equation, lambda dot equals lambda times rho minus F prime. So here we have an ordinary difference equation in two variables. And then here are two of the initial, here are the two boundary conditions. Now in this case, our boundary conditions are both on assets. You're born with nothing and you aren't allowed to leave with anything and you decide you're just gonna leave with nothing. So you don't have to have boundary conditions in for all the variables, for each of the variables. You just have two boundary, two boundary conditions and that settles it. Now, here is a picture of what um, the system looks like. You can now, because you know this function C equals C of lambda, you can now replace it by a differential equation in little c and big A. And that's kind of uh, um, intuitive. And then what you see is that, okay, there's um, a, a dot equals zero um, when consumption equals, no, A dot, okay, consumption, uh, sorry, that's not exact, consumption equals, by the way, um, W is a constant here, I believe. So, uh, yeah. W is meant to be a constant. 
Oops. Oh, well, okay. No, it's it's not a constant. But uh, at any point in time, this is the picture you're going to get. This this line is not uh, correct, but I'll fix it anyway. What happens is that at any we know that assets start at zero. Now then, we guess a low level of consumption. And then what's going to happen is that the assets are going to grow, 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 but also consumption might grow, might get to a point where assets are falling. Um, this should be the line C equals F of A plus W, basically consumption equals net income. Now, if consumption is above net income, then, it, uh, then assets start to decline. Now, um, here, if we start with a high consumption, then the assets will initially rise, but because consumption is so high, you're going to ultimately drive things um, and to, to having negative. You're going to be borrowing, 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 and you're not allowed to die until you've paid off all your debts. So basically, the solution will be some point here in between, such that if you start there for consumption, you will your consumption path will smoothly move along until at time capital T, your assets will be back to zero. Um, so that's, yeah, so here's uh, the phase diagram and um, for this. So this is shooting. And it's used in optimal control models. Now here, so suppose we have optimal control, you have a capital stock, K dot equals F of K minus C. Uh, and then you have an initial version, uh, initial value for capital at time zero. And, and so we have two, two variables, consumption and capital stock. And then now going through your um, Hamiltonian equations, you find out that C dot is U prime over U double prime times rho minus F prime. K dot is the difference between net output and consumption. Now, we have one boundary condition is a simple one that capital stock at time zero is the initial capital stock. Now, the other boundary condition, you see, by the way, the horizon here is infinite. Uh, we, and we, we can't say, oh, well, K at infinity is some value. What value should it be? Who knows? The transversality condition at infinity basically tells us that asymptotically k should be bounded. That as time goes to infinity, the k path should not diverge to either plus infinity or minus infinity. Here is the phase diagram for a typical uh, growth model. You, um, here is the line where Okay, here's the line, C equals FK. So C equals FK, then that means that K dot is zero, which means that the arrows there are going to be totally vertical because if you're at any point along here, uh, K dot is zero. So there's no movement left or right because K is the axis down here. So no movement, so you will um, be uh, vertical at this line. Uh, and also vertical at this point. Vertical here also. Now, but what are the other directions? Well, if you're, if you're in the quadrant, if you're, if you're up here, uh, what's gonna happen is that C is gonna be bigger than FK, which means that K dot is going to be um, negative. Now, the other key line here is when, when are you going to have constant consumption? When is the consumption path going to be uh, constant? Uh, that would correspond to an arrow like this where the arrow is horizontal because at this point, the um, uh, change in capital stock, no, the change in consumption, it, uh, change in consumption is going to be zero when rho equals F prime. 
And so you may have a movement in the capital side, but nothing in consumption. So it's going to be horizontal here and here and here. So now when you add all that up, you know that if you're in this region, you're above C equals FK and you're below this, this line that uh, things are going to move in the northwest direction. If you're here, things are going to come down, cross this line, and then uh, converge more and more to the left. Now, what happens, so we do this, for, so basically what happens is that the problem is divvied up into eight regions, really. Um, now, the only solution that is stable is one that goes along this path, which we have called M sub S, which is the mat stable manifold, S for stable. If you start here, you will go up and up and up and along this, and then get to asymptotically get to this, what we call steady state. If you start anywhere else above or below that line, then you will either end up, if you start below, you'll either end up over saving, so saving. So you'll have more and more and more money in the bank and asymptotically, uh, it's not gonna, you're gonna violate that boundary condition, that boundedness condition on K. So we know this is the solution. Now, how are you gonna compute this solution? Well, the problem is that if we make a guess for where you are at this time and then solve it forward, uh, you could either diverge um, in terms of the capital stock became negative or if you had another kind of guess, it would diverge um, towards the right. It may be different, that may also fight against some of the actions that other aspects of the government are taking. So now, um, this isn't very good as a numerical strategy. However, this is how you should, if you're going to do this numerically, you should reverse, do a reverse of the system. Change all the arrows to be the reverse direction. So that is easy to do because um, here's C dot and K dot, and I just take negatives. I write a new system, C dot is the negative of what it was under the old system, K dot's the negative of what it was under the old system. So now everything flows in these directions. And now what's nice is that if you start at any point close to the steady state, um, then the fact that the arrows go in this direction means that you start close to here and you're just going to continuously move down, 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 and, uh, and things will be better. So this is um, an example of why when you're going to solve these things, you rather do backward shooting or reverse shooting than forward. And here's an example of the errors for um, uh, reverse shooting. Um, now, the um, so this is okay. The end of the slides I have for you. Now, sometimes let's go back to the slide for. Okay, so this is um, the optimal growth example. Now, how are you going to do a finite difference version of this? Now, the Euler method is going to say that um, you model C dot as C T plus one um, minus C T. Um, or C T plus epsilon minus C of T divided by epsilon. So Euler would say that um, C, C uh, T plus one or T plus epsilon would equal C T plus um, these things on the right hand side evaluated at, at time T. And then K dot, well, K T plus one would be equal to K T plus this 
quantity multiplied by the time step. Now, you have to think now about uh, is C and K, are they going to be defined? You see, this is continuous time. So there's no such thing as end up period or beginning up period. There's just this instantaneous period. Now, what some economists have trouble with is taking this continuous time system and coming up with a coherent and consistent discrete time system. Now, the way that I typically, and I think most economists typically, um, interpret these numbers is that K at time T is now okay. K at time T in the continuous model, what, what does it correspond to in the discrete time model where you have K at time T and then you have K at T plus H? How do you interpret K of T? Well, K of T, I've always interpreted it as being the capital stock at the beginning of the time interval T comma T plus H. So it's the beginning of that discrete time interval. You see, once when you transform something to discrete time, you now have the beginning of an interval and the end of the interval. <coughs> and you need to interpret that. Um, you have to come up with a consistent interpretation of that. And so um, that's how you interpret, that's how I would interpret K dot. K is a state variable that KT plus one is equal to KT plus F at KT minus CT um, times the step size. Now, K, the K is, I think, easy because, well, it's a state variable. Now, C dot, how do you interpret C? <clears throat> well, the typical way to interpret C is that it is the consumption at the beginning of the time interval T comma T plus H. And it's the constant rate of consumption over that time interval. See, you have to remember that consumption is a flow variable. So uh, when you discretize it, you have to interpret it as being constant during some interval. And it's um, natural to stay with C at t, t being representing the a constant consumption between T and T plus H. Now, this always seemed obvious to me. However, uh, my collaborators, Young Yang Kai and Thomas Lanchek, uh stumbled on to a strange um, code. This is the code that Nordhaus used in the 2007 version of his climate model dice. Now in that code, you have both economics equations and climate equations. Now, what he did on the economic side is exactly what I would do. And that is that his K dot equation, by the way, he formulates the model initially in terms of continuous time and then comes up with a discrete time reformulation. And K at time T is the uh, capital stock at the beginning of period T. However, you look at the climate system variables and you find out that the temperature at time T of the atmosphere Uh, is do, doesn't depend just on past temperature, but it also depends on future uh, CO2 levels in the atmosphere. And for him, future is the next period, the time step is 10 years. So what you have is that the heating of the atmosphere during a time interval T is depends somewhat on future uh, or the, the the increase in temperature between T and T plus 
10 in his case, depends not only on the CO2 emissions at time t, but also CO2 emissions at time t plus 10. Now, that doesn't make sense to me, given my interpretation. How can it be that the rate of change of temperature today depend on emissions 10 years from now? Now, so, so we wrote a paper about this and said that if you did the, these things correctly, um, Nordhaus's uh, social cost of carbon numbers come down by 20, 30%. Uh, the pan some a couple economists at the EPA didn't like that, and so they wrote a long note um, criticizing our note, saying that uh, no, 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 that was wrong for us to interpret temperature at time t to be the temperature at the beginning of a time interval. No, temperature was supposed to be represent the temperature at the end of a time interval. So of course, the temperature at the end of time t plus T uh, would depend somewhat on the remember, and also then remember that uh, the emissions were a flow over some period. So then that was their justification for having the temperature increase at time T depend somewhat on emissions at time T plus one. This is what we refer to as time traveling CO2. So not only do we have to worry about the CO2 that's in the atmosphere today, but we've got CO2 from the future also heating up the earth. Now, our response, which we haven't officially made yet because we're busy with too many other things is that you can't define, there was nothing said about the definition of the K variable. So K was the initial period capital stock, and that's the only interpretation of what their equations are. But then they want to say that another variable, temperature, was defined to be the end of some discrete time period. Uh, this makes no sense. Um, I, it, it makes no sense to me, and by the way, it grossly violates any notion of how to take a system of differential equations and transform it into a system of difference equations um, that you can then proceed to approximate the system of the differential equations. Uh, this is clear. Given your definition of y of x is such that if you're doing Euler, uh, the definition is that you're you're at you start at some you ha you're at some at the beginning of the ith interval you're at some y i and then you look at the gradient um, at that point i or at time t i and then multiply by the time step and that is your next uh, guess for that variable and that's true for all variables you can't uh, now. There are some methods called implicit methods where it looks like future things are happening today, but then they involve everything. Um, so what, what Nordhaus did not like was the idea he had 10 year time periods and he thought, well, there's CO2 being emitted during that decade. And so the um, increase in temperature over the next 10 years would depend on the emissions during those 10 periods, like the emissions at in year five of that period, et cetera. And so he wanted to include this um, term, which introduced time driving CO2 as an average. Well, but the thing is that same logic says you should change the KT plus one equation also because capital stock at the end of this period of time over T and T plus one, that also is going to depend on production between T and T plus 10. Um, but no, that was ignored. So there's inconsistent uh, use definitions of these variables. Uh, you can't go mixing 
uh, saying some variables are end of period, some period variables are beginning of period. Uh, the mathematics of ordinary differential equations says you must treat all equations in your system in the same way when you discretize. Um, and Nordhaus did not do that. Now, um, uh, before our little piece was published, um, I was um, asked by an editor to uh, check with Nordhaus to see what, how he felt about this. And he wrote back and said, well, gee, I guess I need to use shorter time steps in the future, which he did. Um, he also took out the time traveling CO2 term. Uh, by the way, this is also a case of where don't just read the paper or the book in this case. Look at the code because you don't see any problems if you just look at the document, the published document. However, Nordhaus, and I, we praise him for this, does believe in open science um, uh, because we could then go check what actually he did in his code. And that's where we found that his results had this uh, time traveling CO2 result. So that's, uh, that's an example of why people should disclose their code. Notice I say open science. Some people like to use the word open source. Now, open source is, I think, basically worthless. Um, because, you know, uh, suppose somebody gave you the um, executable, uh, gave you the, um, all the assembly language uh, instructions that your compiled code would do. Well, what good would that be to you? Yeah, you, if you know assembly language, you could uh, sort of reconstruct it and understand everything, but that's not comprehensible. Now, or what you could do is uh, you write, you do, you code things up in Java, um, and then oh, and then uh, you uh, use uh, Cplex. Now, the resulting code, by the way, in that case was. I don't know Java. I mean, it's, it's not something that should be used for numerical, serious numerical things. And then how can you actually use it? Because uh, many people would go to the CPLEX website and see that, well, it costs $10,000. Now there is a program where academics can get it for free, but uh, basically people who work outside of the academic world would then have to pay. Ten thousand uh, dollars to to replicate the results. No, I say open science because what Nordhaus provided were the uh, GAMS uh, files that expressed his equations in a uh, very easy to understand manner, and that one could use run using GAMS, which is a widely used. Uh, software framework um, that uh, is used a great deal in applied general equilibrium. So that's what I call open science. Um, just giving you the source code or the un, um, is often uh, pointless and useless. Um, it's like giving you, oh, I, I written my paper in Urdu. All, right, all, the, all, all the documentation I've done is in Urdu. Well, some people read Urdu, I can't. So it isn't open to me. Um, so this is, so this business about how you discretize a differential equation uh, is not as uh, obvious, I guess, as I thought it should be. Um, again, this is a case of where you should never, I mean, economists like writing down discrete time systems. And for many purposes, that's the natural way to go. However, when you write down that discrete time system, you can't just write down the equations in an ad hoc fashion and then sort of use economic intuition to write down the difference, the, di the discrete time system. If you have a differential equation, you start with differential equation, you must use these methods to then discretize the uh, problem. 
Now, I see that uh, um, uh, our time is almost up. Um, now, so uh, this is now going to be the end of my formal comments.